Shall we turn our attentions to the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. I've always found it a bit unsettling when the Gospel reading ends so abruptly. The last words you hear before, peace be with you all, is you can cut it down. And it's always, it, it always makes me a little nervous. Uh, nervous not because I, I don't think that there is a place for this sort of language. I think there is a place for this sort of language. Uh, I do think that there are some people who misuse it and you use this kind of language as a way of scaring you to God. Uh, there is a, a famous theologian um, by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And he is most famous for one of his sermons that he gave. And his sermon was, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I read that sermon. And it was tough. I felt like I was a terrible person. I felt like there was nothing that I could ever do that would ever be good enough for God. And in spite of the fact that I knew all about grace and in spite of the fact that I knew all about how the cross covers our sins, uh, the style of that message made me feel like I'm so bad that even God's grace isn't good enough to fix me. And now, of course, that was not at all his intention. His intention was to show us the extreme difference and gap that there is between us and God, how God is a perfect God, how God is a holy God. And a holy, just God would expect that others would keep his standards. And when we don't keep his standards, uh, it is going to be off-putting to him. We all have our own standards, whether it be at work or at home, and if our spouse or if our co-workers don't meet our standards, we get rubbed the wrong way ourselves too. Is that what's being taught when we come to this passage? Of an owner of a, prop, a piece of land has some fig trees there. He sees this one particular fig tree, and after three years, he realizes that there's nothing there yet. After the first year, of course, we can imagine that he would be a decent enough landowner to know that this is the time for fruitfulness, and so he didn't come earlier than he should have. He came on time, and when he came on the time that was expected to have fruits, there was no fruits there. And on one hand, we might see that as a picture of God. On the other hand, we then see that there is this gardener who pleads with the master and says, give me one more year. Let me work on it. And so you see the gardener as being Jesus, and then some people take it a bit further, and I'm not too thrilled with the analogy, which is that the fertilizer could represent the Holy Spirit. In that whole process, though, you see that God is at work. And you see that there's a certain standard, a certain level of expectation that is demanded of the tree, of this fig tree. When we close this year, we have to ask ourselves, how fruitful have we been this year? How can we evaluate this 2018 and give an account to the landowner for what he finds on our branches this year? Is our one year over? I don't want to get into the theology of that. But let me put it in uh, this context. There's, uh, we all know of the um, man by the name of Andrew Carnegie, a very wealthy person. And on the eve of New Year's, so on New Year's Eve in 1863, while he was alone in his hotel in New York, he was 33 years old at the time. And already he had been a great success. Uh, as he had achieved goals that he were set beyond his wildest dreams. He, that year, had made $56,000 in 1868, and by then he had already accumulated close to half a million dollars in assets. But on that eve, and even though he is an atheist, there is a strong Scottish Calvinist tradition that on New Year's Eve, that you take stock of your life, and you do some sober reflection and self-introspection, 
And so there is this sentence that he wrote down, that Andrew Carnegie wrote down on that night. And even though he's an atheist, he said this, to continue much longer overwhelmed by business cares and with most of my thoughts wholly upon the way to make more money in the shortest time is quite possibly degrading me beyond hope of permanent recovery. When we talk about fruits, we should be very careful about how we define these fruits. Because quite possibly, when we look at our lives, there are certain metrics that we can use. And if we evaluate our lives by those metrics, we are probably a success. Uh, the Indian community, the Indian ethnicity in America is the wealthiest ethnicity of all the ethnicities in America. I'm not sure that I doubt that we would be an exception to that rule. I think that we are part of the people that make that a fact and a reality. We have so many things. Are these our fruits? Are these financial accomplishments our fruits? Well, what about emotional or physical health? What about uh, the maturity that we've developed in this one year? Is that our fruit? What about our spiritual maturity and our spiritual strength? What about our faithfulness? Is that our fruit? To what extent in this 2018 have we become more loving? To what extent have we become more joyous or more peaceful people? How have we been more patient in this year? How have we shown more kindness to others? How has our faith been more sturdy this year? How have we in our character been more gentle? Have we shown more self-control as we close out this year? As you already know, I've just listed the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when we come to church, it's quite easy for us to think of fruitfulness in that way. But the real challenge is going to be when we go back to school and when we go back to work, in what sense are we to think of fruitfulness again? Because when I'm at home, even if I just recall the words of my parents, I don't recall them as much saying, please make sure you pray every day. But I do recall them saying, you better study for that exam. I, I know that they want me to read the Bible more, but I seem to recall a lot more that they would want me to spend more time making sure that my life was in order and that I'm not wasting it away. Now, of course, obviously, they did instill in me the right values, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But the words that we speak to one another really do sometimes reveal a difference of priorities that come up in our lives. When we go back to school, when we go back to work, we are going to be surrounded by this secular world. And we're in a community that needs this word to be defined. If you're coming from India, secular means freedom of religion. Meaning that in any place, you should be able to allow any religion to have its say. America is a little different. America's to change that word uh, meaning a little bit differently. And in America, secular doesn't mean freedom of religion. A secular here means freedom from religion. So that it's not right for us to speak in Christian terms when we're at school. You're not allowed to pray there. If you're a nurse, you know the difficulties in being able to sit and pray with a patient. You're not allowed to do that. And in this kind of a setting, what does it mean for us to be fruitful? It's understandable that we can be fruitful when we're in the church. But when we go out of the church, what do we do? Now, understanding the concept of fruitfulness should not lead us into a thinking that makes us believe that church life is the end all and be all. Church life is not the majority of your lives. In fact, family life and most likely work and school life are a majority of your lives, time-wise. 
And if that's where you're spending most of your time, it's very important for us as Christians to be able to understand how does this message become relevant in that secular context. God, when he created the universe, uh, he revealed to us something. And that is that he is a God that is at work. He is a God that enjoys doing, whether it be by saying, because in Hebrew thought, speech was just as powerful and profound as action. Or whether it be like Genesis chapter 2, where he's actually playing in the dirt and creating Adam and Eve, creating Adam and then Eve. Regardless of how you see it, he is a God who is at work. One of the things that he tells Adam and Eve is to take care of it and keep it in reference to the garden. He gives them work to do. He doesn't say, Adam and Eve, pray to me all the time, sing all the time, bring out your liturgy and worship all the time. Why doesn't he say that? I don't think that he was implying in any way, shape, or form that those things are not to be found, but that those things are obviously supposed to be there every time you're doing anything. So that as you work, you work prayerfully. And even the very word, the liturgy, which comes from the Greek word liturgia, it means the work of the people. Work is very much a part of God's plan. God was not thinking, I want you to be a good Christian, but I also know that you need to survive, and so I'm going to give you this job. Bear with me on this. Do it as well as you can so that you can come to church or that you can go to the shelter or that you can go home and then do the work that I expect of you. That's not how he does it. He sends us to those places as our task because those are our mission fields. He doesn't call us to do a task for eight hours or 12 hours at a time. As Christians, our Christian vocation means that we are 24 hours on duty. That whether we're at work or whether we're at church, we are called to be fruitful. The same fruitfulness that we find listed to us uh, in Galatians, is, in, sorry, is, in Galatians is supposed to be found in our lives when we go to work. There is a way, and, and I was uh, in the process of figuring it out before God, God gave me the luxury of being able to focus solely on ministry in the form of priesthood, but as an engineer, as I was doing my work, I did struggle with this. In what way is writing code praising God? In what way now, as I see, is it looking after two kids worship how is this sanctified service when all i can think of is this is what i should be doing teaching preaching administering the sacraments isn't that what god called me to do yes and no he's called me to do this now but just like all of you the rest of the week he has given you a very specific task and goal that when you go to work you are to express the nature of Christ to your co-workers. That they would be able to understand that you are not just another rat in the race. That you're not like everyone else, that you still have a purpose in life. And they should be intrigued by that. Now, this is difficult to do. So difficult, in fact, that God anticipated its difficulty and said, work but on one day of the week, stop it. Rest. Come into my presence in a tangible way and remember that I had sent you into the world for a reason. Don't lose the sanctity of that. Come back here, remember it, and then go back out there again. I'm so thankful, extremely thankful that we all are here today. I don't mean to sound rough, but I know that the reality is that on January 1st Sunday, the attendance will be less. And then we wonder why we struggle with finding ourselves being fruitful on Monday through Saturday. 
Church is very important. Not because it gives me something to do or people to talk to. This is instituted by God. Sabbath. Rest. Come into my presence and let go of everything else and focus on me. We get the blessing of starting our new year with Sabbath time and reflection. When we go back to this passage, I want us to recognize that the passage begins in a very peculiar way. And it changes the context of this message almost, almost entirely. In it, it goes like this. There was a time when uh, people, Galileans, were being killed by Pontius Pilate and uh, their blood was being mingled with their sacrifices. This really disturbed the followers of Christ and so they went to Jesus and they probably asked, why did this happen? Why are these people suffering like that? And Jesus' response to them was, do you think that because the Galileans suffered in this way that they're worse sinners than any of the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also perish as they did. Or, do you think that these 18 who were killed when the Tower of Shalom fell on them, do you think that they were worse than other offenders that were living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you also will perish just as they did. And then he goes on to talk about fruitfulness. So I think what we need to understand is this. Repentance is not something that can be seen from the outside by external actions. Nor is the genuineness of our repentance understood by what happens to us whether it be Pilate killing people or whether it be a tower falling on them, these things do not validate a person's genuine response in repentance. What does validate a person's response of genuineness is their fruits. Are we being fruitful? If not, does it perhaps stem from the fact that we have not genuinely come into his presence in repentance. That we come here thinking that all is fine. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. This is how my parents raised me. Let me do it and go home. In that way, 2019 will be just like 2018. But today we must realize that this lesson speaks to each one of us. When we come before God's presence, we must come in true repentance, opening our hearts to God and seeing what we have done in straying away from Him. At this time, I want us to, we'll be moving in, I think the, the New Year has, we'll be beginning in a minute. And as we take some time uh, to reflect, Ooh, the choir will be singing a song, candles will be passed, we will say a word of thanksgiving, and we will begin the new year with the prayer of confession. The prayer of confession is a sacrament of the Martha Church, one of the seven sacraments of the Martha Church. And so, we will be doing it in this manner. We will begin with a moment of silence where we can all spend some time and think critically about ourselves and examine our own hearts before him. Then we will go into the prayer of confession, first in Malayalam, which will be repeated after me, and then in English, which will be said in unison. And in this way, I pray that we all together can meaningfully participate in the prayer of confession. Shall we all rise?